Hello, everyone. I'm just waiting for everyone to be able to have access. Welcome. Still see a couple of people popping up. Give you one more minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Whole Communities Whole Health Interdisciplinary Seminar Series. And I am so excited about today's topic of identity, acculturation, and community. And I think today's conversation is going to leave us wanting more. Uh, this is a little bit of a teaser here. It is a, a contemporary topic, um, one that is near and dear to all of our hearts and our speakers today have dedicated their careers um, to developing research models around uh, this topical area and, and certainly that of social justice. I'm gonna do a couple of minute overview because the series is sponsored by Whole Communities Whole Health. I will introduce each one of our four speakers and then we'll take some questions at the end. So I appreciate those who are returning and um, are part of the series, uh, our continuing series. And for those of you who are new to Whole Communities Whole Health, I just wanted to take a minute and talk about what we're all about. You know, in Texas, uh, we face some unique stressors and particularly 11% um, of the population of children uh, are actually represented here in the state of Texas. And we have some things that, you know, maybe are not necessarily our points of pride, where we rank 43rd in overall child well-being, and uh, the state is the highest in um, socioeconomic disparities among children's health. We want to take those uh, a little bit more of a strength-based perspective, and certainly there's a group of people who care about that and care about our community. And we're researchers, we're community members, we're community partners, and we're all working together in this initiative or a grand challenge, which we call Whole Communities Whole Health. It's a longitudinal cohort study on children's health, and we involve local families um, as part, as ambassadors, as co-facilitators and co-directors in our research. And our main goals are to come away with a better understanding of the social determinants of children's health, to engage families, maybe who have not traditionally been involved in research studies. We welcome our participation and sharing of resources and co-researching by our community partners. We always strive to have an equity-centered approach. Sometimes we fail in our attempts and other times we need to revisit those attempts and try to get to the point where it is an equity-centered approach. And we conduct interdisciplinary research with 12 different units involved in all of our research project. Del Med, um, the Department of Psychology, the College of Education, uh, Health Communications, thank you, Mike, for organizing our webinar series, um, and many, many more, um, certainly engineering and kinesiology and health ed as well. Our perspective is one of the individual child first and foremost, but we look at the relationship between the child and the family and the family embedded within the community. And that's why today's topic and the experts who've been working so hard um, to gather information and to work with these families is so important to us as a bedrock and the foundation of the work that we're currently doing. We understand that some of the issues that emerge are systemic in nature. And what we hope to do is by engaging the community on a regular basis, we can provide feedback to families to ultimately create a chain of advocacy and where data are utilized for them to um, meet the needs of the community and meet the needs of the families within that community. Some of the outreach activities that we've been doing um, have to do with focus grouping, um, a community response where we have uh, supported the distribution of vaccinations, a mobile uh, assessment of air quality. We've given out family care packages and, and also engaged families with family activity packages uh, so that physical activity was not forgotten during COVID. And we have a community strategy team of approximately 12 members. The final loop to all of this is for us to have outreach and feedback and we have done so through the development of an application. It is a phone application 
where families can report their concerns directly to us and we can respond to the concerns that are being forwarded. We also can provide feedback directly into the family um, on where their data that they provided for us is aligned or misaligned with that of the uh, larger community. And so in a nutshell, that's what we hope to accomplish over the next five years. We have been in the community already for a three year period of time. And on that note, what I'd like to do is stop sharing my screen and go ahead and introduce um, our first speaker and allow our first speaker to actually go ahead and get her slides up here. I'm pleased to introduce um, Carmen Valdez and she is in the Department of Population Health at Dell Medical School. She has multiple talents and we're gonna keep the bios kind of brief today um, so that you can um, spend more time engaging the speakers. Thank you, Dr. Valdez for being here and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I will be speaking today about identity and belonging of youth and immigrant families. Um, and we'll start by uh, pointing out, which I'm sure many of you know, that adolescence is a key period of time um, in which identity uh, develops, crystallizes. And um, we know that healthy identity development is associated with positive peer outcomes, academic outcomes, and an overall well being and sense of belonging, which uh, belonging really is at the core of being one's authentic self in day-to-day -day spaces. And you can imagine then that in identity development, you have family, community, and social factors that are influencing uh, one's, how one sees uh, oneself. And although there have been many models of Latinx identity development that focus on acculturation or focus on ethnic and racial identity, they fail to fully capture the complexity of many Latinx youth, particularly those who's, who live in mixed status families. And so mixed status families are those where some children are born in the US or are naturalized or have legal residency. Um, and we would tend to call those um, with authorized status. And then there may be other members who um, either arrived in the US without proper authorization or overstayed a visa. And typically that's the parents and um, at, at least one child. And what we know is that while the unauthorized youth have the experience of living in two places because they were born outside of the US, um, they, develop, they develop strong affiliations with both places, and yet they uh, lack privileges um, in the U.S. to be able to pursue their dreams um, as promised um, by this nation. And so, um, and I will give some examples later of what that looks like. And um, so the sense of illegality becomes part of their identity, and this is especially the case when they transition from adolescence to adulthood. Now, their peers who do have authorized status or their siblings with authorized status do have these privileges, but they often underutilize them out of fear of exposing their um, undocumented family members. So that can also create a great deal of shame um, uh, related to their family's immigration status. And we know that is not, um, does not lead to positive outcomes and identity development. So I will be talking uh, very quickly about the Lives of Immigrant Family Study, which is a 10-year study of 10 youth, um, 10 Mexican-American youth from mixed status families in Arizona. Uh, those included interviews uh, with youth themselves, their parents, teachers, observation and archival data, as well as drawings. And the purpose of the youth study in particular was to explore what those salient identities are and to look at the role of immigration status and immigration climate in those identities. So um, what to start with, 
what we found in the youth who have authorized status, and I used authorized in quotes because no human being is authorized or unauthorized, um, is that very much like white youth, these are youth who, um, they, you know, their identities are largely shaped by activities and goals. They want to be soccer players. They, they, they see themselves as being really good academically, or they see themselves, um, you know, based on, on music or interests. But unlike white peers, these youth um, also tend to see themselves based on where they were born, but where their parents were born as well. So they say, well, I'm, I must be Mexican because my parents were born in Mexico, even though I was born here and, and in my home, grew up speaking Spanish. And so, you know, there, there's, you can get a sense of how their, their parents' situation um, influences them. And although these are US citizens, um, they often feel that their pursuits are undermined by both negative rhetoric around um, undocumented families, but also out of protection for their families themselves. So these are youth who talk about not traveling, um, not taking advantage of many opportunities because they, they don't want to expose their families. And um, these youth also talk a great deal about, about um, what it means to be immigrants. And so a few youth you know, refer to their parents as being immigrant parents, but in some cases, they really struggle to reconcile their view of their parents as immigrants with society's view of immigrants, and you know, which tends to portray them as criminals um, and or rapists. And, and so they often what they end up doing is they separate their parents or they they deny that their parents are immigrants, or they um, spend a great deal of time defending the legitimacy of their parents. And there's a great deal of concealment that also happens um, based on the shame or the secrecy of, the, of their parents and siblings immigration status. Now, in terms of their unauthorized um, siblings, so siblings with unauthorized status, we see a great deal of ambivalence about what it means to be from the US or what it means to be um, Mexican and I have um, had conversations with multiple youth who maybe uh, arrived in the US when they were six months old. So all they know really is life in the US and yet they are very much aware that without a paper or proof that legitimizes their identity that they feel almost undeserving. And so many youth talk about, well, I don't, I feel like I'm from the US, but I don't have citizenship or I don't have papers. So I'm really not from the US, but, but then where am I from? Because everything I know is from here. So you can see the, the ambivalence and, and the struggle that they experience. And, um, and many of these youth, it's when they're 16, 17 or 18, which is the first time they need a social security number to obtain a driver's license, apply for a bank account, apply for a scholarship or for college, is, is often the first time they realize that they are undocumented. And so there's a great deal of pain that they experience and limitation in their lives. So in conclusion, um, the identity of youth and immigrant families is concealed and unlike ethnic identity or racial identity, which is not concealed, it's very visible. Um, youth who are immigrants often do not tell others about their status. And so when we think about interventions, it's not enough to think about racial or ethnic socialization. We really have to think about immigration socialization which is very different, much more complex. And if we don't do that, then we see uh, identity trajectories that are ambiguous, that are seen through the eyes of others. And that is not a good recipe for um, positive outcomes later on in life. And I do leave you with this quote and uh, drawing that hints at, you know, in spite of the 
tremendous challenges that these youth, youth face, there's also a great deal of resistance and hope. It's a very valuable form of resistance. Um, and I don't have time to talk up more about that, but I'm happy to do that during the discussion section. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Valdez. I would strongly encourage individuals to go ahead and put questions within the chat. And we would like to move on to our next speaker quickly, and we will try to address as many of those questions as we can at the end of our session today. Our next speaker is Elma Lorenzo Blanco. She is an assistant professor in human uh, development and family sciences here at UT Austin. And thank you for being here, Dr. Lorenzo Blanco. Thank you for having me, and thank you for joining us. Uh us this afternoon. So I thought I'll give a brief and quick overview of my research on perturbation in Latino youth and family well-being. And with well-being, I will focus on mental health, behavioral health, both substance use, tobacco use, but also academic well-being. Um, and so in a lot of my work, um, I draw from the perturbation frameworks. Um, and these frameworks often assume or suggest that human beings and particular parents can experience changes, um, cultural, social, psychological, and behavioral changes as they, as they navigate cultural context. And in these frameworks um, that I often draw from, it is proposed that the human beings and parents um, they can draw from both. Um, their Latino but the US American culture streams to form their identities, their behaviors, their practices. So in these frameworks, acculturation becomes a stock that consists of both Latino and the US American culture, practices, values, and identity. And in general, um, it has been shown and proposed that appearance, maintenance, engagements were a position cultural practices, values, or identifications um, leads to positive health, um, to more positive health or well-being outcomes, while um, maintenance, acquisition, experience, and engagement um, being as American cultural practices, values, and identifications is start to lead to more negative health or well-being outcomes. And so in some of my work, on acculturation, really what I do, I seek to understand why these dynamics exist, and I turn my attention to experience that can come with the acculturation process and um, that can impact health and well-being. And in some of my work, I also look at um, for whom those dynamics are true, so for whom um, you ask the question is more positive, uh, the more negative health outcomes. Um, and most of my work has looked at gender relation. Um, so, for example, just to give an example of one acculturation experience, one experience that can come with the acculturation process is perceived ethnic discrimination. And so, in some of my work, I use um, longitudinal data with Latino youth from Southern California to see whether perceived ethnic discrimination. Um, serve as a mediator who explained the relationship um, the officer in the scholarship um, from acculturation to US culture to youth because of symptoms in cigarette smoking. Um, and so what I found in the study is that perceived discrimination indeed um, kind of explained that link um, between again acculturation to US culture and youth because of symptoms in cigarette smoking. I also found that these relations were stronger for girls than for boys. Um, and so, building on that and related to this line of research, um, I've also had a program of research where I tried to seek to understand um, the experiences of Latino parents. And so, in some of my work, um, one by the Spanish trust model, I feel called parent cultural stress. Um, to get parent depressive symptoms, so higher parent cultural stress, more parent depressive symptoms, and more parent depressive symptoms, then predict um, worse or compromised family functioning, 
and have compromised them, fashioning them in turn, and predates the way we use emotional and behavioral health outcomes. And I tested this um, with um, 302 families, using in front of two families, so families who have decided in the US um, five years or less, um, and they came from Los Angeles or Miami. And so basically what I found is kind of the model you see here. Um, so clinical pressure stress, which in the study um, was operationalized as experiences of perceived discrimination that parents experience, the culturally the stressors, and also a negative context of perception. And so basically, yeah, clinical pressure stress is predicted by depressive symptoms, um, which predicted um, gross family functioning, and then leading to um, less favorable use emotional and behavioral health outcomes. And so I think um, very briefly, some implications of my work today, um, both youth and parents experience this when we think about acculturation, um, even identity. Um, and if the doctor I guess um, showed as well. Um, and also that acculturation oftentimes comes in the context of the family. But at least in my field of study, we often view it as an individual phenomenon. Um, and also through the context of the matters. So I'm currently doing work in schools in Austin, um, some more qualitative work. And so kind of the experiences of youth and parents in, in schools can be the impact of acculturation journey. Um, whether they feel pressure to um, acculturate, whether they feel they can, you know, speak their um, the language they speak at home, um, whether they can be themselves or not. And also, at least in my in my field of study, there's a really common assumption in acculturation research. And the assumption is that acculturation starts when immigrants move to the United States or when US born children begin to be exposed to US culture um, by navigating US institutions. So there's the assumption that there is direct exposure to US culture. However, in um, as you can imagine, this globalization and all the um, exposure we have to countries, cultures, um, foreign that we've never visited or have interacted with, um, the youth, Latin American youth, um, they may um, acculturate to American culture remotely, so without having any exposure, direct exposure um, to the US. And so this idea of remote um, exposure or remote acculturation um, in the literature um, has been defined as a modern form of non immigrant globalization based acculturation, um, suggesting that um, Latin American, I use Latin American countries, they may draw from um, US American culture, but also their culture of birth origin to construct their identities and their behaviors. And so one Latin American country um, that has very um, close contact with the US is Mexico. Um, and so I received funding a while back um, through a minority supplement to kind of test these ideas. And so on the left hand side, you can kind of see a measure that I developed. And um, so on the top, there are four items that tap into acculturation to US culture, so US culture orientation. And on the bottom, you can see a um, measure of Mexican culture orientation or orientation to Mexican culture. And on the right, you can see some structural inflation among the results. But basically, what I found here, and that's very consistent with the acculturation literature in the United States um, with Latino youth, is that orientation to American culture. Um, was associated with higher tobacco use risk by way of more positive smoking related attitudes. And orientation to Mexican culture was associated with lower um, tobacco use risk um, by way of less positive smoking related attitudes. And so this work on remote, remote acculturation kind of challenges some of the assumptions um, we make about acculturation. Um, that it requires direct exposure, um, that it doesn't, yeah, that it directly requires direct navigation um, with US cultural institutions. And it also kind of suggests that maybe acculturation starts way before 
um, youth come to the event, or families come to the United States, way before youth maybe step foot into the schools or start navigating um, US cultural institutions. Um, yeah, and some implications, I think, with the mode of punctuation is that I do think um, one next step would be to kind of merge the globalization based punctuation literature with um, the immigration based punctuation literature to kind of get a better understanding. Um, also, some, some next steps would be kind of really look at the context that I mentioned and talk about this, I think, tap into some of these contexts, right, and diversity. Um, yeah. um, well, thank you to our first two presenters. I, I think you further justified um, our longitudinal study and also provide an excellent frame for us in our interpretation of our work. I would like to introduce our third speaker while she's putting up her slides. Um, Dr. Quinones Camacho is an assistant professor in the Human Development and Culture and Learning Studies Program in educational in the Department of Educational Psychology. Um, thank you for being here today. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the opportunity for uh, me to share some of the work that I have been doing in the past on uh, Latino children's mental health uh, and how we can take our understanding of a more basic developmental psychology process and apply them um, into the understanding of mental health with a cultural lens in Latino families. Um, I am a brand new professor, so I've been thinking a lot about how to expand the work that I have done in the past, um, how to make it more relevant more, uh, to the communities, more community centers. So if anyone has any thoughts on that, um, greatly appreciated. So uh, right now I'm just going to talk very, very briefly as, about some of, um, how, of the ways in which I have integrated um, these developmental psychology approaches into the understanding of Latino children's uh, risk for anxiety. So there is a growing body of work on how Latino children and Latino youth more broadly um, are at a high end risk of experiencing anxiety disorders. Um, they are more likely to experience symptoms of separation anxiety, somatic symptoms, high levels of worry. So um, uh, reporting more stress, uh, more fear. Of course, some of it is driven uh, by larger societal issues. Um, uh, some of it is driven by uh, daily experiences of racism and oppression. Um, and some might be through the socialization of particular um, cultural and emotional practices. Um, so while we understand, so we know that these children are at a higher risk of um, experiencing anxiety, um, and we also know that they're being socialized emotions differently. Um, so while the experience of emotions and uh, the need to somewhat regulate them or change them is largely universal, um, there seem to be many cultural differences in what is considered an acceptable way of expressing emotions and acceptable way of regulating them. So because children are learning ways to regulate emotions within um, Right, as sociocultural context, it is inevitable that cultural uh, values and societal norms will influence uh, how they not how they learn themselves to regulate their emotions, but how caregivers are helping them in the process of learning them. So we know there are differences in how in what kind of emotions um, Latina fa uh, families value, how um, Latina mothers uh, are likely to, reg, um, to model how to express these emotions and um, how to regulate them. We also know uh, from uh, work on learning and observation on uh, learning through observations that uh, values of uh, familism and a highly Inter high, a uh, high interest in social ties and family dynamics uh, helps children learn uh, more easily through observational learning than in other cultures. 
So to try to integrate this, uh, these sets of work um, in this study that I will be highlighting today, we explore whether we could use what we know about Latino children's learning through observation and so indirect modeling of behaviors and apply them to our understanding of risk for anxiety within the Latino community. So this paper is now conditionally accepted in the Journal of Child and Family Studies. Um, and we collected, for this study, we collected data from a sample of eight to 11 year olds. So these are children that um, are at the cusp of uh, starting to show uh, disordered level of, of anxiety symptoms and who are likely to have already acquired some level of ability to regulate their emotions by their own. So we asked uh, parents how they uh, regulate their own emotions and how likely they are to engage in um, specific forms of emotion regulation um, in front of their children. And then we also uh, asked the children many questions about uh, their mental health, their emotional regulation, um, and so on. And so the, the specific question we wanted to ask here was whether caregiver socialization of emotional regulation, uh, in particular more uh, complex ways of uh, thinking about how to change uh, your emotions, was associated with anxiety symptoms in children who um, are at risk of experiencing anxiety, but who uh, most of them uh, don't have uh, disorder levels of symptoms. And so what we found was that uh, Latin, Latinx caregivers uh, who use more complex forms of emotion regulation, so they, they have these more advanced ways of regulating their emotions, um, had children who have fewer anxiety symptoms, even when they didn't describe um, directly coaching these children uh, through how to do these more complex forms of emotion regulation. And this seemed to be the case even when controlling for socioeconomic factors that um, can, can influence this association, suggesting that um, this ability that's been shown before in more uh, learning and general observational settings can be applied to um, how children, how Latinx children are learning how to uh, navigate difficult or negative emotional uh, situations um, and the impact that that can have on their anxiety symptoms. And so uh, that is just a very short snippet of the kind of uh, work that I have been doing, combining these two things that are, of course, many things to do moving forward and many more um, approaches that I can take in trying to explore these kinds of associations. So I'm also interested in um, understanding how these processes become internalized uh, to the point where um, we start to see these differences even when we're not conscious about these uh, decisions that we're making based on these cultural values um, to extend it to so Latinx families um, are, are often larger families that where, where there are multiple adults who are involved in the rearing process. Um, so looking at more, at more of those like family level associations, um, thinking about how um, early they start, these differences start to emerge. Um, when can we notice them? And if we can use all, all this information that we have about the broader societal context, interacting with um, this, social uh, socialization of emotion practices in Latino families to predict who is at the highest risk of experiencing um, significant mental health problems throughout childhood and later on. So I'm going to end here. Um, and if anyone has um, any thoughts on um, any of this or um, collaborations, definitely open to it. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Well, I want to thank um, our first three speakers for staying right on time. You've done a wonderful job, and I appreciate that. So let's start filling the chat with some questions for them, because we are going to have a little bit of time um, at the end here after our last speaker. Um, Dr. Jermaine Awad is an associate professor in human development and culture and learning sciences and the counseling psychology programs um, in the Department of Educational Psychology. Um, Gigi, that's a, that's a mouthful right there, the programs that you're involved in, um, but thank you for being here today. 
thank you all for having me. I'm going to actually start a timer for myself. Okay. Um, so um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so excited to see at least your pictures on Zoom here. And I'm so excited to uh, present with these illustrious um, speakers today. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit um, with my talk um, in that I am going to talk about um, first, I'm going to just generally talk about my research area, but I'm going to shift gears in terms of the population um, that we're talking about. So my primary research areas are in the um, areas of prejudice, racism, discrimination, and I have studied both predictors of prejudice and racism, discrimination, as well as the experiences and that's um, of discrimination. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. And part of what my research has been on is how do um, racial and ethnic, uh, how does racial and ethnic identity and acculturation impact perceptions of discrimination um, for folks of color? And the particular uh, population that I'm going to talk to you about today um, are Arab and Middle Eastern North African uh, Americans. And part, part of the reason is because so very little is ever talked about with this particular population. Um, but this is really the core of my acculturation and identity work. And so one of my, the first studies I did many years ago was trying to understand the experience of discrimination with this population and um, really getting frustrated with the literature that there wasn't um, a disaggregation of experiences by um, religious identification. And specifically in my study, I um, examined the discrimination experiences of Muslims and Christians um, of Arab MENA background. And I also wanted to see if there was an impact on of acculturation on their discrimination experiences. And so just to get to the end here, basically what I found was that um, acculturation as de defined by dominant society immersion, that is how acculturated you are to dominant society, um, did make a difference in the perceptions of discrimination based on religious identification. So for individuals who were low in um, dominant society immersion or acculturation, um, they uh, essentially perceived similar um, levels of discrimination regardless of um, religious identity okay, or identification. But we saw that religious identification did make a big difference in perceptions of discrimination when individuals were actually highly, reported high levels of acculturation to dominant society, US dominant society, where um, uh, Arab Muslims reported much more discrimination compared to Arab Christians, right? And so um, this study was done way back when, but it was one of the first that sort of really disentangled experience of uh, Arab Middle Easterners, but especially in regards to um, discrimination and acculturation. So this really led me to do another study that was a little bit broader um, that asks the question, how are discrimination experiences of people of color similar and different? And so what I set out to do was I wanted to examine um, diff four different groups specifically, Arab and MENA folks, Latinx folks, Black folks and Asian Americans. And so I actually took a, um, some time to collect these data and I ended up with 2,279 participants. Um, and I collected these data actually uh, partially in a subject pool and partially by snowball sampling within the community, especially um, as it pertained to Arab Middle Eastern folks because it's really hard to identify them and that's a whole different talk. Um, so overall, um, I had a decent sample size. I didn't, uh, the, I had about uh, almost 300, um, African-American participants and you see the breakdown here. I won't go into that too much, 
But um, when I went to go actually test this <laughs> structural equation model, it was this super complicated model here. And um, instead of going back and testing this particular model, I really wanted to add some extra layers. And that is I wanted to examine not only how our discrimination experience is similar or different, but what type of discrimination experiences relate to uh, what types of mental health outcomes, okay, as here um, measured by anxiety and depression. And so the, the four types of discrimination that I examined um, were essentially notion of being devalued, uh, threat and aggression, rejection and avoidance. Okay. So since I have exactly seven seconds, <laughs> let's get to some of the main findings. And what um, I found was that individuals who are more acculturated, that is higher, uh, have higher adjustment to dominant society tended to report less discrimination. And this had um, the opposite uh, relationship with ethnic identity as measured by belonging and affirmation. Um, those who had stronger ethnic identity um, or stronger sense of belonging and affirmation um, actually reported more discrimination, which is exactly in line with the literature um, in many contexts. Uh, this was true except for threat and aggression um, where stronger ethnic identity was actually related to fewer types of this um, type of discrimination. Um, and in terms of mental health, higher levels of devaluation discrimination was related to higher levels of anxiety uh, and depression. Um, for Latinx and MENA participants, but was not significantly related to mental health for African Americans and Asian Americans in this particular sample. And I just want to make a note, this was also before COVID. So I assume that if I were collecting these data, this would probably look different for Asian Americans. Um, and then what I also found was that discrimination characterized by threats, aggression, rejection, and avoidance were positive related to depression and anxiety across all groups with the exception um, of Latinx participants where uh, threat and aggression discrimination was not related to anxiety. Okay. Now, I completely am out of time, but I'm happy to entertain <laughs> questions um, in the chat and after. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for um, all of your presentations. And we, we do have a couple of questions that are um, popping up in the chat. So uh, let's go ahead and um, start uh, the series of questions. Um, so <laughs> they're coming in so fast that they're, they're jumping over one another. So if I've missed yours, um, go ahead and, and put it back in there again. Um, the first one that I saw is for Dr. Valdez. And how do you plan on measuring and assessing um, the different types of identity? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, well, and the, the project that I discussed, um, I wasn't necessarily setting out to identify different types of identity, but more to describe the process of identity development for youth who were authorized versus unauthorized. Um, and, but however, I think there's plenty of evidence uh, both from my study and also from other research to suggest that uh, we could look through um, quantitative studies or longitudinal studies, look at um, how identity um, is formed into different subtypes. For example, we see that some youth may feel um, more closely affiliated with their um, uh, country of origin, um, and you know, in terms of traditions, in terms of activities that they do, um, of how they feel, um, their sense of belonging. Um, so we could we could compare definitely um, differences between youth based on their particular affiliations, but we could also look at differences between um, youth of immigrant families who experience the threat 
of um, immigration climate versus those who have actually experienced deprivation from immig immigration climate. That is those who have a family member that's already been deported and where they have to uh, adopt different roles um, and, and in, which could also shape their identity. So I think that's a, a really valuable question, uh, future direction. Um, I'm actually right now um, thinking about writing an R01 application to follow a large sample of Latinx transition age um, youth to especially um, you know, be able to measure some of those differences. Thank you. Um, Sarah, since you turned on your video, did you want to actually ask your question or would you prefer that I read it? I, I can ask. Uh, um, my question was, I guess, for any of the three first speakers as it relates to Latinx um, and Hispanic youth health, can you discuss some of the protective health factors that may have emerged um, that either derive from their family values, culture, or experiences? Any of our first three speakers? And uh, any of our four speakers, it's specific to Latinx, but um, anybody want to take that question? I can get started. Yeah, so I think in I think some of the protective factors that come from the family and family values are a lot of the cultural values and connect with those family relationships, family cohesion, um, communication, um, and things like so family service, cultural. So this is one of the protective factors. I think um, identity has been shown to be a strong protective factor in kind of parenting strategies. The blend of many Latin parents can be teaching about sharing their cultural values, heritage, traditions, um, those kind of things. And I'm going to be working on the paper to kind of fix a book. Um, for mom, who's an immigrant family. Um, there's a lot of, um, well, not a lot, but there's, um, you know, like scholars have hypothesized um, that Latino use um, kind of medleys, um, psychological strains that they come with to the United States, so it seems like hope um, as a result of discrimination, racism just stressors in the United States. Um, what I'm finding actually is just the opposite, um, that hope increases um, during the first few years of immigration. Um, so there's some, I don't, so this is um, survey research, I think um, it would be a nice part of the research, but it would be nice to do it, you can see um, what happens. Um, but they are, the hope is increasing. They come with high hope and it's just increasing. Um, so I think a lot of the literature is kind of very deficit based, um, but it, there's something that you know parents are doing youth are doing that are kind of really promoting their most and loving. But I don't think, yeah, it's survey research. I don't know why or what it is, but I think that's something right to explore. Okay. Thank you. Did anyone else want to add? Sure, I can, I can also quickly add that um, uh, in terms of protective factors, I think all individuals under oppressive situations find ways to work within the system, through the system, and around the system. And, and I think in particular with immigrant families, um, immigration policy is intended to um, discourage them from being in this country or to encourage them to return to their countries of origin. But that is a very low probability that that will actually happen. And that is because the communities figure out ways of congregating, of sharing resources, of um, you know, finding ways to do well. And uh, in part, that comes from that hope, that motivation, that persistence but also because as human beings, we're all very resourceful individuals. And so I think those are some protective factors is 
it's, it's really trying to figure out a way through in and around the system. And I think that's a big protective factor. I know that we have a question from Mike. So I'm gonna ask a question. It's, it's one, very selfish, but also inspired by a question I got from uh, some students yesterday. I was, I was guest lecturing in a uh, class in Darla's uh, department actually. And I was talking about health literacy and we were talking about sort of a, a variable or something that students thought like more people should just measure kind of just in case or something that could be useful like, like as a, another thing to kind of like always have top of mind when you're doing your research. And so we're, we're about to start, our center is about to start a new project on substance use disorder around Texas. And I, I'm just wondering, like you all are so awesomely focused on such important issues, but I, I'm trying to think of like how to take things we can learn from you all and build them into projects where the focus is on all kinds of other things. And I would just be curious if you have any recommendations, not that I need like a reference and a scale or something, but like, what are the ways, what are the things you think other projects could most benefit from adopting into the way we build interview guides, surveys, like how, like what's your biggest recommendation, how others can make their general research better through the things you're focused on? I could jump in here. Um... Part of my area, other areas are multicultural research methodology. So, um, and one, one thing I would say is that if you in your study at all wanna look at ethnic differences or racial differences, A, make sure you have a good demographic questionnaire that's gonna capture nuance. I would say this is incredibly important. And B, if you wanna make any statements that culture or ethnic background or racial background has had an effect, you better measure a process variable, either identity or whatever, but something that's more proximal to the outcome than just the demographic grouping variable. So that's really what I would say is really important. So good measurement in demographics and just being able to describe your sample well, and if you're gonna talk about anything racial, cultural, make sure you have those pertinent measures in there based on your research questions. I, I would also recommend, Mike, that um, when you study a condition like substance use, it's, um, we inadvertently um, can end up pathologizing uh, the group. And which is why I think it's so important to also examine structural factors, uh, sociopolitical structural factors, so that we understand the context of substance use, right? Like what is substance use a response to and a way to cope with um, and, and to really look at the different layers at the personal, personal, um, community, you know, basically the, the diagram that Darla showed at the very beginning of the, of the different social ecological contexts, so that um, we, we use the data to address those conditions and that we see substance use as a consequence and not a condition. I don't know if I missed it, but I don't see one in the chat. So I was going to ask a question um, that's, again, I don't like Mike, a little bit selfish, uh, but uh, I, I think it's pertinent for all of us. Um, as we seek extramural funding, um, what are the requirements is to provide this, have this conversation about need and statistics about need, but yet we want to shift to the strength-based language and um, acknowledging families and individuals for where they are at the process of acculturation. And, and I feel that there's these tensions and I was wondering if, if anyone had any tips about navigating or advice and moving towards strength-based language um, opposed to that, which is just one that's focused on need. If anybody else wants to go, but if not, I, I can. <laughs> um, 
a, a model it, that has that has been it's a very, tough one isn't it sorry it, it is a tough one it is but a model that has been influential in my work is is one that's called the extended case method mm -hmm. and and it it really has helped me um to think about my work as in in terms of the challenges that people face and the way that people interact with those challenges. And they interact with those challenges in, um, through substance use, like in the case of, of Mike's project, or through um, you know, significant despair, economic hardship, but they also interact with those processes in, in ways where they still manage to experience joy, to um, experience resistance. Like I've worked with many adolescents who in spite of being undocumented, they, you know, at 14 years old, they, they take their parents car to go to the movie theater and they don't have a driver's license. They're not old enough to drive. And, but it's a form of resistance. It's, you know, developmentally, that's what you do, right? And so um, I, I guess my advice would be is to just learn look for different models that help to explain both the needs, how to capture the needs, but also how to capture these, these um, uh, forms of strategies that people use to do well, which I think we really need both. If we're going to develop interventions or inform policy, we really need to assess assets and, um, and resources. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last question for Laura, because you didn't get one. And um, so if in, in whole communities, whole health, one of the things that we are trying to do is, is respond and provide feedback. Um, so when we do acknowledge that there is stressful situations and it emerges um, that, uh, you know, maybe there are certain indicators of that particular stress or sources of that stress, um, I was wondering if you could talk to all of us just a little bit about uh, what might be an appropriate response and whether it's providing feedback or um, some sort of resources. Uh, the appropriate response from the research group, right? To that, yeah. Um, well, so there are, um, I guess, a multitude of things that. Um, we could do in a situation like that. Uh, re, uh, providing resources um, is 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 an easy one. Um, one of the reasons why I like emotional regulation, even though I, I speak about it in a pretty like conceptual basic science way, is that it's so easy to to be applied as an intervention and uh, is very cost effective right so just talk about like so are there ways to there there are so these communities often have needs that are like just they need to be met through additional resources so for example if the stressor is is coming from um uh issues with with water right so the, the that's there's a difference there and then there are other stresses that may be more um proximal to the family dynamics in which um, tips on, for example, how to navigate um, tantrums with, with a child um, through modeling, coaching uh, these uh, emo emotional regulation resources that these strategies that can, that is an easy resource to provide um, that can be applied in the moment with no real, real need to add additional costs. So yeah. Well, well, thank you for responding to that. And, and again, it was it was directly related to our project and, and our hope to be able to um, provide those resources. I want to thank all of our speakers for being here today. I want to thank all of the audience members. Um, we are going to continue our webinar series. And, and so please reach out to our speakers if, if you feel that they are a kindred spirit and you have questions for them, go ahead and directly uh, do that. Uh, I appreciate each one of you and thank you for being here today. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.